Hi everybody and welcome back to another Weedo Talk. I've actually not recorded one for about four months so I'm quite nervous to be back here. But today I'm joined by my friend Campbell. Hi Campbell, how are you? Yeah, good thanks, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I brought Campbell on today because Campbell has recently started his own online premium clothing company. Is that yeah, 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 would perfect. that be what you call it? Yeah. That was actually like a tongue twister to say. <laughs> it's called Boundless and it's got some really nice clothes if you want to check it out. I'll link it down below. But basically the topic of this podcast will be kind of how Campbell started a whole business by himself, what he went through to get to that place, why, the how, what and why basically of Campbell starting his own business. So firstly from your perspective, what would you say Boundless is? Um, in terms of a business, like we market ourselves as an online unisex fashion brand. Um, at the moment, I'm kind of more based on the male side, um, just because I don't really have the time to do like a full set of females yeah. at the moment, but basically a, a luxury sportswear brand. It definitely does look unisex. Like I yeah. would buy the stuff on the website, except maybe not the trousers, because they'd be too big. Yeah, that's the thing, like the sizes, like I've like, because I can like, fit stuff to myself yeah. I can get like the male sizes really like well um, whereas the female stuff I just need to like size everything down a bit and like obviously females have different like body proportions yeah well. definitely so that's like a bit of a headache to get over at the moment but so that's like maybe the next step that's like the next area that I wanted to try and like nail yeah I definitely think that's something when you start your own business it's like there's so you think like you can have an idea and it seems like, oh, I can do this, but yeah. then there's actually so many intricate details of oh, what man. you have to do. Like, it's, I guess, Every day there's like a new thing. I know, it's like, overbearing. <laughs> there's never like a breath or a pause. <laughs> literally. Literally every single day there's a new a new thing that pops up that you go, fuck, why did I not that? think of that? <laughs> yeah. So one of the questions that actually was on the Instagram, normally we, we will go to Instagram questions at the end, okay. but this question came up and it was actually something I was wondering. Yeah. The way I would word it is, what would differentiate, in your opinion, Boundless from other clothes companies? So like our unique selling point, I guess. Yeah, unique selling point. Yeah. So I guess our USP would be, like for me, is we're a premium product at affordable price. In terms of like the market, you've got like your, your high street fashion and your fast fashion, which would sort of come in like, you know, you're really cheap and affordable. So you've got like Primark at the base up yeah. to like H&M and like Pretty Little Thing and stuff like that for girls, Boohoo for guys. And then on like the opposite side of the spectrum, you've got like your Gucci and Balenciaga. Yeah. We like slot in that sort of middle point where we offer the same quality as those designer brands, but you can get it at not the same price as fast fashion, yeah. but an affordable and attainable price. It is, and also I noticed that the one of the things you said on your captions was that it's organic, was it? Or sustainable? Uh, so we're, I don't advertise as sustainable because we're not sustainable yeah. uh, as like a business, but we are carbon neutral in our carbon, products. Carbon, that's what it was. Um, so we offset all of our emissions. So it's not perfect. Like yeah, it's not but like I we're mean, using it's organic. almost impossible to get things perfect. Yeah, it's so difficult. So we offset all of it in uh, sort of CO2 through like tree plantation. Yeah, that is that is I think something that really differentiates you from other brands because I know a lot of people start Instagram brands and things like that. That really stood out to me when I saw yeah. your page was that it was CO2 neutral. So I thought that was like quite important to mention, I don't know. Yeah, not in 2021, I feel like all businesses should have a goal to be sustainable. Yeah. So I don't think it should be like a USP, like wow, look at that brand, they're sustainable. Yeah. It should just be a given that you're going towards That's that. That's really true, actually. That is very true. But maybe I should promote it more. <laughs> no, I, no, I think so, because although you're saying like it's, and you think morally that every company should be working towards it, but like if you think about a lot of businesses, they aren't really bothered about that. Yeah, no, they don't care at all, to be fair. Yeah. Um, but they, they make money, so. They do. <laughs> And like, you know, so they do have things that make it easier to, like, there's reasons why people shop and it's cheaper yeah. and all these things. But I do think that's really good. Like, that is the fact that, like, it is as good quality as these high-end brands and it is, you know, it's not overly expensive. Yeah, it's definitely not. And in terms of, like, your market audience and stuff, like, I'm still finding, like, my target audience yeah. as such. And, like, the product hasn't obviously reached all of those people yet. Um but like for a student, it might feel expensive at points compared because everyone's just so used to fast fashion. Yeah. You go back like 30, 40 years when like e-commerce and like the internet wasn't really a thing. And like everyone goes into stores and everything costs you so much more Ex to buy. Yeah. And so, there's a lot less of it. Exactly. Well, in your wardrobe anyway. Yeah, definitely. So it's just, it's just a little bit of a change in sort of moving back towards that area. That's good as anyway, because I think focusing on just having you know a few good products in your wardrobe that are better quality rather than 
that already is, you know, making things sustainable in a way because it's like you've just got a few things yeah, in your wardrobe. Exactly. And they are like I've looked on the website, obviously I know all of the products they sell, and there are things that you could wear like quite often. I mean you ju- you could just wear that anywhere you go. Yeah, that's the thing, like I guess Campbell's wearing one of the boundless yeah. tops right now. <laughs> I guess like in terms of my products, like obviously I'm advertised as sportswear. Um, but in terms of like the style and, and stuff, like I take a lot of inspiration from like for example like the Mike Tyson boxing area where they use like a lot of heavyweight like cottons. Um so for example stuff like that you're not actually gonna train. Like I wouldn't actually like go for a jog in this t shirt because yeah. it's too heavyweight, but it's more like the aesthetic that we're going down. Yeah. Um so street I wear work. it for every day. Yeah, that's yeah, sort of street definitely. culture. Yeah, I love I love streetwear personally. Yeah. I mean who doesn't? Yeah, literally. like skater style I feel is just it's not skater style, but like that kind of Streetwear is never going to go out of fashion. No, it's, it's like not. timeless. Yeah, exactly. And it's black and white. <laughs> yeah. Is all of it black and white? Not all of it. I've got some like cream tones and like the sort of like, I guess, if you looked at like a mood board, I'd have like neutral tones. Yeah, neutral tones. Um, it wouldn't just be black and white, but it would all be like sort of neutrals and washed colours and stuff like that. Nothing too bright. Well, Campbell actually brought me a bottle today and a pair of boundless socks. So. That was very kind of him, so I'm going to keep these and wear them. Quite excited, because I haven't actually bought anything from Boundless yet, but I'll test these and see I what I exactly. think. I'll let Thanks, you guys Laura. know. <laughs> um, so, why did you start Boundless? I originally went to uni um, up in Dundee and dropped out after three weeks. Three weeks? Yeah, it lasted three weeks. Give a good bash. <laughs> Give a really good bash. <laughs> what were you doing? Uh, sports science. Oh, did you just hate it? Just hated it. Yeah, so I used yeah. to play rugby quite competitively so I used to kind of want to do that and I got injured in my last year of school and I thought like oh sports science is like kind of a good link like yeah. go to uni and do that don't really know what I'm doing but like that sounds all right yeah. so I guess that's my link to like sport and then dropped out of uni and then after that really long after that sort of yeah after that, <laughs> <laughs> after that long try yeah. um and my parents were like you need to go and get a job like if you're not going to uni oh, like, really? you need to do something they're, they're like you're not sitting about the house yeah, and then um, so I went and handed my cvs out and got a job at jack wills so that's sort of like the start of the fashion the one in edinburgh was it yeah on oh, george so street right okay so you're from edinburgh originally uh, just outside in east Lothian, okay. but i went to school in edinburgh right and um, so started working there um, worked my way up to like a supervisor position and then I took an assistant manager role for June London which is a shoe brand yeah I um, know June and worked there for six months before I went to do marketing at uni so that's like my retail background where I get like the okay. e-commerce so you, you so, had it first hand yeah so I've sort of like done all the areas that I'm now working in yeah um, which sort of like built to that picture and then I guess the reason I wanted to start my own brand and business is like my dad's always done it so I've always oh, seen okay like how enjoyable his life's been and like he like works like on his own time frames and stuff like that yeah um and i guess because of that as well like nobody's ever told me like you can't go and do that whereas i think a lot of people stress over the idea that like you go and like you fail and then you don't have like yeah. a, a job to back you up whereas i've always just been told like what's the worst that could happen failure doesn't have to exist in your own life if you just see it as like oh you don't have to see it as a setback yeah you can see it as like a try failing in, in general i think yeah it's a perspective yeah definitely like I look at it as like micro failures like you might fail at some like one small area and it's like a micro failure and then you learn from that and then you can grow further Um, that's definitely how I see it whereas people like look at it as like oh my god like this one thing's going wrong like just stop there yeah like if you take it as like a learning curve like just don't do that next time yeah exactly and as long as like in terms of myself like as long as there's money in the bank then it's fine exactly like obviously if you spent like every single penny you had on some like awful piece of stock <laughs> it would be quite a big failure but like you can still recover from it wouldn't it. even necessarily be a failure it would just be like a bad choice yeah like. it would just be a very bad choice <laughs> but yeah uh, there obviously are different ways that people can fail but I still think the word like it is just defined by your own opinion of it yeah it's all about the associations isn't it and definitely and as you're saying like you know you're obviously going down working as a solopreneur how is that in terms of working with your schedule because I know for myself like I obviously am a freelancer I work kind of my own hours like I have to do a certain amount of things but yeah. I like that even though there, it brings a lot of stress to it because it's all things are different and there's always loads of different things you have to do Yeah. but you also can be in charge of your own life like what's your opinion on that sort of lifestyle yeah I really like it to be honest like as I was saying to you before um, at the moment like it's not I'm not quite as in control of it because I do my internship at the moment so that's like Monday through to Thursday um, but in terms of like the managing of like the rest of my time like I love that 
Like, I like to be able to, like, get up and, like, if someone does want, like, if I want to do a meeting and go for lunch or someone, I can do it. I can pick up work afterwards. Yeah. Um, I also find, like, I work better in short periods of time. So, like, if I got up in the morning and worked for a couple of hours, I'd actually want to go and, like, go to the gym then, take a break, get some food, come back and yeah. work, and then go again and work in the evening. Um, so I, I personally really love it. I do have to, like, structure my day and I will... Every single night or in the morning, I'll write a list of everything that I need to get done in that yeah, day. Yeah, that's what I do as well. And then it goes, you know, it doesn't matter if you finish it all, like you can just go into the next list or whatever, but as long as you get that done in the day, then you've, you've been successful. Yeah, I definitely think some people prefer having set hours to do things. Like, yeah. I personally really found school difficult and university better because with, like, set really structured breaks, but then when I got to uni, I could structure my own life and, like, motivate myself in my own ways. And I find, like that is better than nine to five yeah but it really it depends for everyone yeah definitely no i find as well like i'm quite like emotional so like i'll get like tied like i might get like an email and like my stock's not coming for like another four weeks like or it's like stock it's stuck in customs and that will like throw off my day yeah and if i was working in like a nine till five like i wouldn't get work done for the next hour because it would just frustrate me you'd have to be like so i can like go take a coffee break go away, come back, and then just work an extra hour on the other side of it. It's kind of like, at work, they've got the... What's that attitude again? It's like, leave your personal life at home. Yeah. But, like, I don't know. I think a lot of that's changed now during the pandemic. Definitely. Because like, people <laughs> people are a lot more lenient with everything, and obviously a lot of stuff's online and things like that. So I think they're probably more understanding with taking breaks, taking time off. Yeah. I think a lot has actually started to change with the 9 to 5 five days a week work week have you seen that Iceland's doing now four days work yeah, week yeah it's like a massive shift especially yeah. in like um, my internships in like hospitality recruitment well, yeah you're doing four days so I do I work a four day week yeah. with them um, is that new then for them they've actually done it for a couple of years um, but they're in terms of, the of they are ahead of the game <laughs> to be fair no they're actually a really good employer um, but in terms of like loads of the businesses that we work with because we specialise in hospitality um, and there's a massive like shortage of hospitality staff at the moment in the UK. Yeah, there is. Um, so I mean, it makes our job pretty easy because we're recruiting. So business, loads of businesses want to hire us at the moment. Oh yeah. Um, but in terms of the work, like you're working with businesses to try and make the roles more enticing now. And realistically, like nobody wants to work a seventy-hour week in hospitality, like slaving over people's tables. And businesses now have to sort of adapt to that, like. You know, now they are offering people like a four day week and they work maybe like 10 hours a day. Yeah. And then they get a three day weekend with like great holiday benefits and stuff like that. So I was quite excited to hear this, the answer to this question. Are you happy with the response that you've got to Boundless? Because it's been pretty impressive. Do you reckon? Yeah, I think it has <laughs> been. No, I've been actually really happy. Like, obviously, going into it, like, you just have no idea what to expect. Yeah. Um, so like in the build up, like I had a really good response and I worked with quite a good few people who were obviously kind of in like the influencer industry, which I think sort of gave that like a little extra drive yeah, it's right way um, to go. and like really pick up on, on that sort of thing. But obviously I had no idea where to go and like that's where I guess my friends and family have really like come in, like loads of people supported me. Yeah. Um, and then sort of like with pushing the marketing side, I'm sort of starting to like build like a different sort of like... Um, area of people who are really coming into it now so like I guess more of my tar- target audience because like obviously you do have friends and family like my parents are never going to wear my brand because it's just not like the demographic for Wait, example. Wait why you need to make some like older <laughs> some people. older people who <laughs> Yeah is that even a thing? I'm sure they'll appreciate me saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a market that you could like that's I think that's a gap in the market because I don't think I've seen like adult actual adults I'm saying actual adults but I'm 20. So yeah, like sort of starting to like really build into like my proper like client base, I, I suppose. Um, whereas obviously a lot of friends and family from support at the start, um, and I'm really sort of starting to like build a, a customer. Um, and surprisingly, I've had loads of international support. Oh really? Um, so I've like I've already sold to uh, the US, Australia, all across Europe as well. As How like, are they finding it? Are you promoting your posts? I run like uh, Facebook ads. Right, and is that to Europe and the US? It's quite like a complex process, but we basically run top of the funnel and then bottom of the funnel. So at the top of like the funnel, it's like a wide neck of like anyone will see my ads. Okay. And then, so say like you saw my ad, and this can go to anyone. So we, we run a few different campaigns. So we yeah. run campaigns for the UK, Europe, and then we do like age. That honestly must be extortionate. Yeah, the marketing side of it is so expensive. Um, but it's, it does like pay itself off to an extent yeah um, it's an investment exactly and that's the thing like up front you feel like you're spending a load of cash yeah. but like once you have a customer it doesn't cost you money to retain them as long as like your product's good um, 
so once you secure that customer, like it might cost me a hundred pounds to gain that customer. Yeah. But if you buy like a hoodie and a t-shirt, like that's that paid off. That's really and true. And then every purchase after that is profit free. to be made. Yeah. Well, so not free. But. Not free, but you know what I mean. You get yeah. the point. So it's sort of I guess that sort of traction. Um, but yeah, you sort of run ads, and if you saw my ad and clicked on it, then you would start to go further down the funnel. Uh, okay. Um, and then you get retargeted. So if you click my stuff, and then you might visit my website. And then I know you visit the website and it tracks yeah. you through that and it will send you more and more and it will like retarget until you purchase. And then once you purchase, you probably purchase again. Probably. So it's all about that sort of structure. So I, I think for anybody that's watching this podcast that's interested in starting their own business, I don't know if you can answer this question, but what do you use for the analytics? Um, I use a sort of series. So I run my website off Shopify. Okay. Um, so Shopify have a really good back office. So I get a lot of my analytics from there. Then Facebook, the business suite on Facebook. Yeah. Um, so you've got like your ad manager there. So I get a lot of my analytics from there. And then I also use Google Analytics as well. Google Analytics. So the sort of three are a really good combination, to be honest. Um, and between them, you can pretty much cover everything you need to know. Yeah. So I'd, I'd say that's a good starting place. Google Analytics especially, because it's free. So that's a really good starting point. If you're selling like a product, then obviously your website. Um, I think Squarespace do it as well, but I would definitely recommend Shopify because you get all that sort of data for pretty much next to nothing. And is, is Shopify what you made your website on? Or is that, yeah, yeah it so, is. That's, so they sort of cover that whole thing. And to be honest, like um, lots of people, like big businesses are like wary of them and stuff because like, they control your site. Mm. So there's that sort of like edge of, of wariness. You have to trust them. You have to trust everything. them. But if you look at it now, like all of the big brands do it, all saints run on them now and that sort of thing because yeah. they're so competitive and like if I went and built a website it would cost me £10,000 with like a WordPress yeah where, £10,000 whereas like I use shop, Shopify and like you've got like rates starting at like $30 all the way up to like $500 like reasonable so you're trusting them but like you're getting it cheaper exactly and you obviously pay a rate on each, each transaction as well um, but for myself it's just a lot better yeah that's it that's I think that people that like have come to watch this will be interested in like these yeah. things that want to start their own business. What piece of advice would you give to yourself if you were going to go right back to the start? If, or if you could go like in a time machine, you know, right back to the start and tell yourself? It's a good question, actually. Um, just take more time um, and just don't let like the excitement sort of like get ahead of you. Like I'll quite often like put a picture up of a product yeah. on social media and then go like, I haven't even like ordered my downstock on that. So now I'm like eight weeks lead time. And yeah. People are like no longer wanting to buy like the product before. Yeah. Because I've just like teased out something else. Um, but it's just because I'm just so excited about like bringing no, that new stuff. Sense. So yeah, just uh, like make sure that you kind of control your, your emotions. That's a really, really good piece of advice. Like I wasn't expecting that. But <laughs> I can relate to that as well because when... I edit like videos and stuff I get really excited for them to go out yeah. and I'm like right I need to put it up now but then it's like I then watch it back and I'm like if I spent another day on this yeah, it right. could have been 50 times better more people would have enjoyed it and watched it that's like my Instagram content like I'll do days or like weekends where I shoot content all weekend Yeah. and then I'm like oh my god I've got so much content let's just post every single day like yeah. twice a day and then in like a week I'm like where's all my content yeah. gone <laughs> like I don't have anything to put out anymore so it's just about finding that balance yeah finding that balance that's good Um. so now we're going to go on to a question we got from Instagram has there been any major setbacks so far and if so how did you overcome it so yeah I've, I've had a really big major setback in the sense my first order of stock, uh, I spent like half my budget on, like stock budget on. Yeah. Um, and it was like a 12 week lead time. Bear in mind, I, I placed this at the end of January. Mm -hmm. um, last week, I just got my second sample for the product. So like that's like just one piece, just because it's just gone so badly. Like the manufacturer like couldn't reach like the standards and the quality that I was looking for, even though like they promised me all these different things. Yeah. Um, which was like a massive setback because I'd waited 12 weeks for this like Have sample. Have people ordered it? Or no, no so, so these are the two products that were going to come out first. And so like I thought in January, okay, 12 weeks time, I'll have like that whole collection ready to go. Yeah. I mean, I'm still sat here in July and I've had one sample from the back. Six um, months? Yeah, so I probably, I'm looking at that to come out about Christmas time for that product. Really? So like don't put all your eggs in one basket oh yeah that's well how did you choose your manufacturer well 
that's a that is a story that will take a long time. But it's just <laughs> there. It's a nightmare to start. To be honest with you, because you can't really you don't really know who to trust. Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, like you put in one like contact and like my WhatsApp is filled with Asian girls. What saying like, what? They just message me going like we're selling like sportswear clothes. Like come to our manufacturer. Oh my goodness. And obviously, like I put it into one like search engine. And they've just like sold my data onto like thousands of different businesses, and now I get like inundated with messages all the time. That is so bad. You'd almost want to like change your number. Yeah, literally. And I don't know whether. So I just go through and block them all. Um, but you don't know who's like a good like manufacturer at that point. So I guess it's looking for reputable sources. Um, so which to be fair, the manufacturer that I'm having the problems with yeah. is a very reputable source. They actually manufacture a few products for like like Dior. Oh, so sometimes um, it's just your luck. So it's it's your luck, and I think I guess like when you're a big business, like people want to impress you, and when you're a startup, yeah. they go like we'll push them to the back because they yeah, matter. They're like they're cutting their losses, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So no, on our way to fixing it, but that was a, a big setback because I had to find a new manufacturer and then get different products. Me. to get it launched <laughs> that is so stressful yeah. I honestly would I don't know how you do it by yourself oh uh, honestly I was uh, that was a tough day but you're looking now to like hire more people and things yeah so you're building up yeah I'm wanting to do, at some point in the sort of in the next year I'm just sort of starting to like get to a point where like I can do a lot myself and I can do a lot on the operational side and the social media side and the marketing Um but like I'm not so expert in like sewing and cutting and all that sort of side of it. Um, and I obviously want to do more custom pieces as time goes on. Um, so for example, like stuff like that takes just, like so much time. Like if I wanted to get like this t-shirt to fit a bit different, yeah. I would then get it back from the manufacturer. We'd make tweaks on the product, send it back. And like, I'm just not an expert in that field. Yeah. Um, so there's people like that that I'd love to bring onto the business. It's just making sure I do it at the right time. Okay, so I think to end it up, We've kind of covered what your next steps maybe are, but other than hiring people, what else would you say some of your next steps are for Boundless? Get a proper, like, a unit to work in. I would really like a storefront, um, but I just don't think it's financially, like, it's just, it, well, it's just not a good financial option. Anymore. Yeah. E-commerce is, like, where basically all your money is worth spending, um, but I would just like it for, like, the sake of having it. Yeah. And just, like, having, like, a really cool hub. Like a boutique. Um, yeah, exactly. Like, a little boutique store. Like, probably not in Edinburgh, to be honest. It'd be more like a London-based place, um, just for, like, traffic-wise. Um, but I would like to get that done. Um, over the next five years as well, I want to have a, an influencer gym. No way. Yeah, so... <laughs> that would... I, like, everybody would be outside fangirling, like, um, yeah. all the influencers are in there. <laughs> would they all be wearing boundless? Well, they could, like, obviously come in in their own kit, <laughs> yeah. but on the walls and everything, it would be sort of kitted out. Everything That'd would be, be boundless branded. Um, and the goal would be that they would all be allowed to, obviously, film all their content and everything for free. Oh, that's... Because I know that they have them in LA. Yeah. But it's definitely not a thing that's in the UK, but obviously... We're always a bit behind, like, there's yeah. now becoming a lot more influencers in the UK. Yeah, exactly. No, we're always one step behind, especially behind LA. But, yeah, um, yeah definitely that's, like, really on the list of things. That, that, that would be amazing. Yeah. Well, I hope that all of your dreams come true and that happens, so good luck with Thanks that. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on here Thanks today a lot well. for coming on to it. And, yeah, good luck for the future Thank and you. for Boundless. And everybody, go and check out Boundless's website and... You know, buy some of their clothes, obviously, because <laughs> you all want to have a pair of these. Like, you need to have a pair of these socks, and there's much more cool stuff on the website. Um, if you enjoyed this talk, make sure to subscribe and like it, and follow us on Apple Music and Spotify, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. We upload a new video every week, so if you enjoyed this video talk, please subscribe and leave your comments below. Thanks for listening.